So we're continuing in our mini-series on Letters for Life, uh, daily practical Christian teachings for uh, how we make it through a world such as this. Today we're in a very famous passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let me pray for us. Father, it's so good to be here, so good to be able to sing your praises and to do it in the company of people who love us and smile at us and are glad we're here. Thank you that there's room in the Father's house for us. Thank you as well for Paul's life, uh, for his willingness to experience and to deal with his worries and anxiety. And we pray that his words would now bless us as your spirit teaches us. In Jesus' name, amen. He writes, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to all people. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Well, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. That we may do all the words of this law. So Paul says it straight out. It couldn't be simpler. Do not be anxious. Great. Thanks, Paul. That helps me a lot. You, don't you love that when you're upset about something and someone says, just chill out. Just don't worry about it so much. This never helps, right? It never helps. You never wanted to say that to my mother either. Calm down, Mom. That was not good. Because it doesn't really work that way. We are full of anxiety and stress, and we need another way into it than simply saying, don't be stressed. Well, I have stress. I have anxiety. What's the path for processing that? Everywhere we go, we're getting pinged and popped and interrupted. We're getting fragmented and called upon. Even our children, who should be living carefree days, are also feeling the effects of anxiety in our culture. They're also stressed out by their schedules and stressed out by their expectations. So I'm so glad that our children's department is doing a seminar on childhood anxiety. I did think, though, it should be titled, Childhood Anxiety, Let's Worry About It Together. <laughs> Alas, the communications people wouldn't let that through. Of course, it's not really funny. It's an important topic, and we're thinking today, how do we deal with the reality of anxiety in our lives? It's not new because the word that Paul uses that we translate as anxiety literally means to break off from the whole, to fragment. And isn't that how we feel when we're worried? You think, I can't get my thoughts together. They keep flying apart. My mind is like dropping a jar of BBs on the kitchen table. It just runs away, and you can't get them all back. It feels sometimes under stress like we are disintegrating. Instead of being integrated back into a whole peaceful mind, we're disintegrated into a million parts, especially in the middle of the night when the monkeys are swinging through our minds and you can't get a hold of anything. We're anxious. We get worried. And Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Now, one of the reasons why his words are palatable is because he was actually anxious quite a lot. Anxiety is something Paul struggled with. If you look at another letter of his, 2 Corinthians, about the 12th chapter, he lists all the things that have stressed him. Getting robbed, getting beaten, getting whipped, getting jailed, getting hunted, getting scorned, getting mocked. Now, that would stress me out. That's a lot of pressure. But Paul says, but none of that is anything compared to the pressure I feel of daily anxiety for all the churches. He worried about the churches, the people of Christ he had gathered. Were they fighting? 
Were they failing in faith? Were they morally collapsing? Were they lacking in energy? It weighed on him all the time. He was anxious about these Christian communities. So when we read his plan for how to deal with anxiety, we can at least relax to know the great apostle Paul himself struggled with this. He felt anxious a lot. So what I wanna do with our time today is walk you through these verses and show the progression of the things Paul is encouraging us to do that will lead us to this great peace that passes understanding and make us reasonable and gentle people. The first thing he says is a wonderful command. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, in case you thought this was optional and we were getting to the real stuff, he says, again, I will say, rejoice. The Lord is near. Paul doesn't say, just don't worry about it. Ignore it, it'll go away. Or just get rid of your responsibilities, go live on an island, kick back, and don't care about anything. That's how you get rid of stress. That's not it at all. He's saying, rejoice in the Lord. He's not saying, feel joy, or trust that your circumstances will resolve happily, because they might not. Actually, he's saying, think about a story that is bigger than your life, and a God who is bigger than your concerns, and lift yourself up into that reality. Rejoice. Rejoice. The Lord is king. Lift up your hearts. Rejoice. This last week, in a study, I asked uh, Pat Canfield, our elder, uh, stated clerk of our session, uh, whose son-in-law, Jamie, is one of our great actors here at the church. He often plays Jesus on Maundy Thursday. Anyway, I said, this was really a, a kind of a lob, hoping she would respond the right way, and she did. I said, what does Jamie do when he's nervous about his lines and a role he has? She didn't miss a beat. She must love him. She said, well, first of all, he prays. And then he rehearses some more. I said, that's it. That's the whole Christian life right there. Are you worried about something? Well, when Paul says to rejoice, he's basically saying, pray and rehearse. Go to God and recite your lines. What lines? The lines of his magnificent story of redemption in the world. See, when I'm worried, what I do is I put my face down in the tangle of my concerns. I can't see anything else. I don't talk about anything else, which is very obnoxious to people around me. I'm worried, 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 worried. Paul is saying, get your head out of your cereal bowl. Look up from your life. Look at the one who is king. Rehearse his story. Recite scripture. Sing a hymn. So last week, I remember I smacked you because I said, by the way, if you're bored with your Christian life, I can guarantee that it means you're not loving as a Christian. Or if people are bored with you as a Christian, it's because you're not loving as a Christian. Well, here's another smack. If you are bored with singing, it's because you're not praying while you're singing. It is impossible to be bored with singing if you are holding up prayers to God as you do it. If we're bored with worship, it's not the worship leader's fault. It's not the hymn selection fault. It's that I need to connect and be lifted up by what is being sung. One great secret for engaging in worship further that I use is while I'm singing a praise song to Christ for his redemption, I pretend I am someone for whom I am concerned singing that song. Like when we sing about the brokenhearted, I hold in my mind's eye, sometimes if I'm good, if I'm on it, someone that I know is brokenhearted and I visualize them singing these songs of him binding up the brokenhearted. When you start to do that, to collect the people that you care about and put them into our praise songs, there is no way you can be bored. You might get tired because it's effortful, but instead of waiting and saying, well, I hope they intrigue me today with something, I'm jumping in and saying, I'm rehearsing the lines today. I'm speaking the story. We might, we studied the Apostles' Creed all fall. That is our whole story in a one-minute version. When you wake in the night with a monkey mind, say the Apostles' Creed. Work through each line. 
See if you can get all 12 verbs about Jesus in your memory. We're rehearsing our lines. Starting this week at our communion services, I'm going to be inviting you to say very succinctly the essence of our story. It's a tradition across many Christian churches. I will be saying, it'll be on the screen, don't worry. Great is the mystery of faith. And I'll invite you to then say, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. It's the whole thing in nine words, maybe ten. He died, taking away our sin. He rose, destroying death. He will come again to set all things right. This is the story that takes my little worried story up into a bigger story. Rehearse. One thing actors know is you've got to rehearse early and you've got to rehearse all the time so that when you get on stage and the cell phone goes off or there is a child running through the balcony during the sermon, I mean the play, <laughs> You don't forget the drama that's happening on the stage because the lines are in us. So too, if we're going to be stressed in life, it's going to happen. When we're not quite so stressed, we want to be building in the lines of our story so that when we're squeezed, they're ready at hand. That's the most important thing to say today, but we're going to keep going through it. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. He's telling them, pray about this. Again, it's pretty obvious. We can get the next slide up. Pretty obvious, he says, pray about it. Just offer it up. But there's a problem that undoes my life in doing that. It's a little guilt loop that I get into. Paul says, don't worry about anything, but pray about it. I start to worry about something and think, I'm not supposed to be worried about this. Actually, it's not really big enough to pray about, so I'm just going to put it down here and pretend it's not going on, and I'll handle it myself. Which, of course, gives it more power, and then I feel guilty because I haven't brought it to the Lord, and it's gotten uh, overwhelmed me. So I'm on this loop of, I shouldn't worry about this, but I do worry about it, but I feel guilty about it, and I don't want to admit I feel guilty about it, so I just keep worrying, and I don't pray. It's ridiculous. Paul is calling us to get out, whatever it is, to just say it. One of my favorite shows is, of course, This Is Us. And one of the characters, Randall Pearson, suffers from acute anxiety disorder. And I think one of the really authentic parts of the show is it shows how the progressions of anxiety work in a life. One of the ways that Randall copes is that both with his brother and with his wife, he plays a game called Worst Case Scenario. They're anxious about something, so they get together and they say, just tell me the worst that could go. Say aloud what it is you're fearing. Watch this clip and see how they do it. We have to. We're gonna do a thing first, so settle in. Now, there's no denying it. You three are getting old, old as dirt. So I think it's time uh, we let you girls in on a little game your mother and I play. It's called Worst Case Scenario. No! Yeah. Now, the rules are simple. We all go around and we say worst case scenario, and then our biggest fears as to the worst possible way our lives can go from this move. Now, if you don't want to go, you don't have to. Worst but... case scenario. Randall never gets over himself, and I have to spend the next four years trapped in my room like Rapunzel. Wow, that was good. I'm a fast learner. My turn. Worst case scenario. Tomorrow when Deja takes the bus to school, she forgets to text me the moment she arrives, and then I'm forced to ground her until she turns 18. Wait, wait, wait. you're gonna let me? Text the moment you get to school every single day. Yes, sir. All right, worst case scenario. Um, that I project my own stuff onto you girls, making you feel anything less than your wonderful, beautiful, wildly unique selves. Tess. See how that works? You just go ahead and say the fear. And sharing it with someone else reduces the power of the worry or the fear. We have this ability as human beings to share our lives in such a way that we can say the worst thing and defang it. 
even if the worst should happen. But as Christians, we have an even greater gift, which is to be able to bring that same worry, to express it aloud to the God of the universe. To just go ahead and say it. God, I fear that I'm gonna make a financial decision so bad that I run out of money and I die alone in a government-sponsored nursing home that smells so bad no one ever comes to see me. I worry about that. Or, Lord, I'm pretty convinced my son could grow up to be a gang leader. He has all the gifts. <laughs> or, God, what if my daughter actually believes that she's a Disney diva and expects everybody to treat her that way? It might happen. God, I think I'm going to be alone and never have a partner or even a friend. Oh, God, I am worried that the world is just, just getting worse and worse and worse and everything's going to come apart. It's a disaster. You just name it out, all the worst fears. And then you ask him for what you want. So God, I pray, give me the wisdom to make right decisions so that I don't fritter my money away. Lord, make me a better parent so my son doesn't want to lead a gang but feels loved. Lord, send me a mate. Lord, draw home wandering sons. Gather prodigal daughters. Bless the sick, soothe the dying. Pity the afflicted and all for your love's sake. I'm just telling you what I want. No filter, no holds barred. You just say it. My worst fear, how I want you to solve it. Then he says, let your request be made known to God by prayer, supplication, with thanks. Funny, we're back to gratitude again, just like last week. Paul is saying, say your requests in all their raw form, only wrap it in thanks so that you don't stay stuck a victim. Yes, Lord, I might lose everything, but I can never be ungrateful for the fact that to this point, you've always provided for me. Yes, Lord, it could all go wrong, but I will give you thanks that I learned that you loved me first, so I'm going to keep on loving even if these people I care for reject me. I'm going to stay in the game because I thank you that you're the God of love and provision and wisdom and answering grace. We name our worries. We make our requests. We do it thanking God, and then last, we need to consecrate what we've asked for. Super important not to do this too soon and say, I shouldn't worry about this. I shouldn't ask for this, so I'll just clean it up and make my prayer about something I don't really mean. No. Say the worst, ask for the most, and then say, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Because I trust with gratitude that you are the sovereign God and that you will answer me, maybe not the way I want you to in my mind, but I will believe and trust that you're answering me according to your will for the sake of your glory, even if the lines above me I can't yet see. This is what I want, but I take this want, consecrate it to your will, asking you to be at work in that way. That's when Paul says we begin to open up the treasure box and one of the greatest treasures of the Christian life becomes ours. He says, the peace that passes understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God will set soldiers around your heart to give you this sense of wellness, of wholeness, not fragmentation, of peace. It's a mystery that you cannot be explained if you've never experienced it, but it is one of the greatest treasures given to anyone who has the spirit of God inside him or her. It is one of the clearest evidences that someone does have the spirit. We stand graveside and weep like other people do. The difference is we don't despair. The hope of everlasting life seeps up even through tearful grief. We stagger when we see the water line on our house at six feet wondering how in the world we'll ever get this thing rebuilt. But we don't say, oh, I've lost everything, or oh, there's no future. Because this peace that passes understanding rises more surely than any floodwaters and says, God will provide. I'm going to be all right. The peace that passes understanding is the most precious gift given to Christians. Because we are rejoicing 
in this story that's bigger than we are. Because we are naming our fears and asking for help, because we are consecrating those fears, the Lord floods into us this sense of peace. Even if your worst fears should happen. We say with Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. He's got the whole world in his hands. And more can be mended than we ever imagined. That leads to one other side thought here before we close. And that is this. If the gift of peace that passes understanding is real, and I testify you to that it is, then the last thing I want to do is toss away my communion with Christ that creates that peace, trying to grasp for trinkets of little lusts, little revenges, little greeds, little grudges. It's so tempting when I'm worried about things to think, well, if I could just get even, if I could just let people know how bad he is, then I'd be at peace again. Or if I could just have that, if I could just have that time, that experience, then I'd be at peace again. And I start to trade away the peace that passes understanding to get a little squirt of immediate satisfaction. It's like giving away treasure and getting back bubblegum wrappers. Don't do that. Consecrate these sinful desires because you're making a trade. I want more than anything the peace that comes from communion with Christ. So the last thing he says then is about focus. Given all of this, if you're following this process, let me tell you where to look. Whatever is pure, whatever is true, honorable, just, and lovely, if there is anything that has excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. We're very prone to spend our lives playing the game, ain't it awful? How many conversations start with some form of, ain't it awful the way they do this? Ain't it awful the way they can't fix the streets on North Boulevard? Ain't it awful the way the government's such a mess? Ain't it awful? Paul says, wait a minute, play a different game. Play the game, isn't it excellent? Isn't it amazing that we can create a bridge that spans the Mississippi and just go across it in a couple of minutes? Isn't it gorgeous to be able to listen to music that's played so well? Aren't you amazed that people can render back the world with the colors and impressions that they give in their art? Doesn't it take your breath away when you see what we discover in science? Don't you just love the interaction and the trading that goes on between goods and services that allows an entire economy to, to grow and for us to participate in it? These things are beautiful and amazing. Don't you love live oaks? that endure storms and keep rising and, and spreading in their beauty. There are so many things that are good and true and beautiful. And Paul says, you want to stop worrying? Think about those things. In other words, turn off your dang phone. Turn off the news. Hey, what do you know? This trial is going to end up just the way they predicted it would end up. And I didn't need to know day by day what ugly things people said. And the world is still turning. Change your focus. Texts don't have to be answered, especially not in 30 seconds. It'll be all right. Guard the precious time you have with the Lord where you sit in his presence. Focus on things that are lovely, pure, beautiful, and good with gratitude. Then Paul says, the verse we overlooked, then you will be people who are reasonable and gentle. People who are steady at the helm. Who when storms come, treat life the same way they treat it when seas are smooth. Same focus, same process. Anxiety is real. Worries are among us. And sometimes we need professional talking to help us through that. Sometimes we even need pharmaceutical support. These also are gifts from God but they are only meant to get all of us back to the same day-to-day -day pattern that Paul has laid out in Philippians 4. Rejoice and rehearse. Pray and ask. Say what you need. Give thanks, consecrate. Receive his peace and focus on it. Then Paul says, the God of all peace will be with you. 
Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, author of our salvation and lover of our souls, thank you that we get to be here and rehearse your story. We thank you that you are near, that you are with us. We thank you that you still calm storms. You have set the world right and will continue to do so. We pray in your name.